This morning we're going to look at what is the meaning of life. And so if you want to get the feel for how society is looking at that, then what you do is you go to Siri. Hi, Siri. Hello, Siri. Hey, Siri. Mm -hmm. What is the meaning of life? We are all just a speck in the vastness of time and space, but don't let that dishearten you. It takes every single part of us to make the beautiful mosaic that is our universe. Oh, really? Hey, Siri. Hey, Siri. Mm -hmm. What's the meaning of life? Some say it's about appreciating the little things. So I guess that means things like ants and peas and dollhouse and tables. There you have it. Well, what do you think the meaning of life is? I mean, really. Th th that's a little, well, chocolate. Life is like a box of chocolates. So there's salt and, and caramel, or is it caramel, or, you know, the praline, okay. Um, others say it's, it's happiness. Go find happiness. Some say it's what you do. You know, you, you need what you do will define the meaning of life. But, but what is it that really gives life meaning? What's the point of all of this? Why am I here? Why am I here? That's the title. That's the, uh, the week that Kyle and I put on at Camp Mac. We want these little fifth and sixth graders to understand uh, the one life that God has given to them so that they don't blow it and that they come to this knowledge that as they face this one great big world that's out there, that we show them the life is meant to be about God and them. Life is about God and you. Well, welcome to week number two of our series, You Are Made for This. Now, last week I didn't have a series. And uh, it was week number one now as I look back on it, as I was putting this sermon together. You know, I think I can make a three-pack out of this. So last week was You Were Made to Be Like Jesus. Okay, so if you didn't see that, you can look at that on YouTube. Or go to our website. This week is You Are Made to Know God. And next week we'll look at You Were Made to Be Strong in the Lord. But this week it's You Were Made uh, to know God. And we're going to look at an interaction between Moses and God about what life is all about. We say, well, that's Old Testament. But we're a New Testament church. Well, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 tells us this. For everything that was written in the past, referring to the Old Testament, was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. That's why we look at the Old Testament. To take some of the principles that we see in the New Testament, to see it lived out then in the Old Testament. We've got a great example of that today with looking at God and Moses. You know, on the first morning of boot camp, the platoon was dragged out of bed by the drill sergeant, made to go outside, and as is typical, uh, this is their job in a sense, to instill fear then into the recruits. And so he lined the soldiers up out there first thing in the morning, he snarled at them. He said, my name is Sergeant Jackson. Does anyone here think that they can whip me? Surprisingly, a hand went up. <laughs> okay, so we walked over this guy, six foot three, 280 pounds. So you think you could whip me, soldier? Yes, sir, I do. Sergeant grabbed him by the arm, took him to the front of the other recruits. Men, this is my new assistant. Now, is there anyone here who thinks he can whip <laughs> both of us? Well, one of the major lessons that we learn from scriptures is that God is the biggest. He is the most powerful in the universe. And with uh, him standing by your side, there's no one that can whip you. That's what Israel had been learning. <laughs> well, that's what God was wanting to teach Israel. Okay, These last three months, as he has been in their presence, for three months now they had followed God. You know the story. Out of slavery in Egypt, doing all the plagues, all the miracles there. They went through the Red Sea. Uh, as the army of uh, Pharaoh went through, they were all destroyed when the sea collapsed back on them. They followed his pillar of cloud by day and his pillar of fire by night as, they, as he led them to Mount Sinai. And there at the Mount of God, they'd seen his power and majesty. Fire had come on the mountain. The mountain's literally on fire. There's lightning. The earth is shaking beneath their feet. And at the mountain, God asks his people, make a decision. I've seen my power. You've seen my majesty. You've, you've seen then my love and my protection for you. 
And it's time now to make a decision. Do you want to live with me in your midst or not? Well, they answered yes. And what we'll soon see is that the people decided to rethink that decision. They were suffering from what we call today buyer's remorse. Frankly, they were tired of following a God that they could not see. They were tired of following a God without knowing exactly where he was taking them. They wanted a God that would do things the way they want to do things. They wanted a God that they could be comfortable with. They wanted a God that, would, that they could fashion to their way of thinking. Do you remember the first two of the Ten Commandments that God will give Moses and that he'll bring to the people? Let me refresh your mind. Look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. Here's the first one. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. That's the first commandment. Verse 4 tells us, number 2, You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous, am a jealous God. Now, it doesn't even take 40 days. Moses had come down off the mountain earlier, told them what God was requiring as he would make a covenant with them and they with him. Moses goes back up on the mountain now. It's 40 days now. And he's a, Moses is about to come down off the mountain. He's got the tablets of stone with the Ten Commandments on it, inscribed by the very finger of God. And, and, and they, they, they can't even last that long. They can't last 40 days. They, they made a God of their own liking. They took some of the Jewry. Remember, they had plundered the Egyptians, not even asking for it as they were getting ready to leave the Egyptians. God predisposed them to give them gold and silver and said, just said, get out of here. Go, go, get, take, take this and go. And so they, they, they took the earrings and they put them on. They took all the bracelets and away the, uh, the Israelites went. And so they took some of those and they melted it down. They fashioned it into a calf. And guess what they called it? They called the calf the Lord. And they bowed down and they worshiped it. Now, you can imagine uh, neither God nor Moses is really excited about this development. Moses comes down from the mountain. Here's the people engaging in this pagan worship. They're, they're dancing there. Uh, they're not sure if this Moses guy. We don't even know if the guy's alive, they say. Who knows? Who knows where this guy is? And the mountain's on fire. Aaron melts these, uh, the jewelry down, makes this God. He molds his calf, and he said, here's your God. And away they went. God is angry. Moses is infuriated. And Moses takes the tablets of God's law now that had the finger of God written on it, and he throws it down there at the ground and, and, and just dashes it to pieces. Then he goes down. He grinds up then the golden calf. He then puts it in their water and makes them drink it. He rebukes Aaron then, who made the calf for the people, at their request, and deals harshly then with all the people who refuse to repent of this abomination before God. Moses then goes back up on the mountain. Exodus 32 and verse 31 tells us, So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Oh, for leaders like that today. Caring for the people so much. They, he said, don't do it. Do it to me. Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. This just... Uh, just speaks against critical race theory on a side note. One of the basis of critical race theory is that people should be punished for the sin of their forefathers. And so a Christian, as a Christian, you can't, you can't support critical race theory. That's a premise. That the ones who are after the ancestors, you know, the ones have, if they've committed the sins before you, you're to be punished now. You're to be judged now for, the, for their sin. You're to be guilty of their sin. God says, that's not how it is. Exodus verse 33 now, well, excuse me, verse 35, and the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. Now we go on to the next, Exodus 33 and verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, 
leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. I'm sending you. I, I'm going to be faithful to my promise I made to the, to the patriarchs, to your forefathers, and I'm going to send an angel before you, and I'm going to drive out your enemies in the land. It's going to be your land. It's going to be yours. But I'm not going with you. If I go with you, you wouldn't make it there, God says. Well, why? Well, anybody had a mom or a dad that said, I, you got them to the point, they were, so, they were boiling, they said, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out, right? Kyle and I, you know, uh, I'll speak for me, when we do the fifth and sixth graders, I mean, you know, they talked about, hey, Dave, would you help out uh, in, in the junior high week? I'm like, no. I don't know that we'd all make it through that week. I just, I just don't. I, I, it's probably going to be me, but I don't, I don't know. But God says, go from here, but I will not go with you because you are stiff-necked people. I might destroy you on the way. So Moses comes down off the mountain. And there is this discussion then as he meets with the Lord in the tent of meeting. Verse 14 begins, the Lord replying, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. He's telling Moses, I'm not going with them but I will go with you. Not with them, but with you. Verse 15, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, what a leader. Do not send us up from here. How will anyone know what you are ple- that you are pleased with me and with our people, your people, unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? God's saying, I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to send an angel. I'm not going to go with you. But Moses says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us then. Thanks for all the stuff. But without you, stuff doesn't have, it's worth, it isn't worth anything. Without you, that's not living. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us. Moses understands possessions don't equal meaning. Possessions don't equal meaning. Moses is saying, life is not about possessions. Life is all about you, God. Now remember when two brothers came to Jesus one time, and they said, would you settle this dispute between us about our inheritance? And Jesus said this, Luke chapter 12 records it, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. He goes on to say, for the pagan world, they run after such things. And your father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. He sums his teaching up by saying this, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If your heart is with your possessions, that's where it's going to be. It's not going to be with me, God is saying. If your heart is with me, don't worry about it. I'll take care of you. Moses saying, without you, God, we don't have anything. God, we need your glory. God, we need your presence. Or we have nothing. Have you discovered that yet? Have you discovered that yet? Moses understood that in the very center, in the heart of every human being, is this nagging, this gnawing need to have God right in the very center of your life. That for you... For a people, that for a church, there's a need to have God's presence right in the center for us to have any meaning, for, for our lives to count for anything. Everything else is peripheral. Jeremiah the prophet, God gives this message at, at another day, in another time. And so through Jeremiah, he says this in Jeremiah 9. This is what the Lord says. So it's the Lord speaking again through Jeremiah. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength. Or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this. That they have the understanding to know me. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. 
Life is to know me, God says. Life is about knowing God, a growing understanding, a growing relationship with the living God. Back to Exodus 33 and verse 17, and the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. Now, how cool is that? to have the Lord God know you by name. Moses would say, not as cool as Jesus saying that he's the good shepherd, and that you are his sheep, and he knows you by name, he calls you by name, and he leads you. More than that, when you came into the family of God, God put his spirit, his presence within you. Moses, when Moses got to heaven, that must have freaked him out. He's dealing with God's presence in so many different ways. And yet, if you would come to to an understanding of your sin and you would accept this gift God has given in Jesus and his spirit would come and live within you after your sins are forgiven. Verse 18. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness. Everybody say goodness. I'll cause my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord. What's the name of that golden calf? What they, the Lord. I will, I will declare my name. I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. Now notice this. Moses says, show me your glory. God says, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. My goodness, God says, the unfolding of my glory is my goodness. The unfolding of my glory is my good. You see, people, want, they, they want to experience the glory. They want the glory of God to fall on them. They want to have this experience, this feeling. God says, yeah, that would, that would happen, yes. But more than that, more important than that, my, my glory is my goodness. One time Jesus was called good teacher. He's approached, remember that time? Good teacher. And Mark 10 that tells us, Jesus said, why do you call me good? Well, he knew why. It was, it was appropriate. Jesus said, no one is good except God alone because God is good. That's who he is. That's the definition of who he is. And, and, and God is saying here, that's my glory. My glory is my goodness. Look again at Exodus 34 and verse 4. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones. <laughs> Moses, you just don't go throwing my, 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 my finger, my, my Ten Commandments. My, you, know, you just don't go throwing that because you're mad. You find some, some tablets. You chisel them back out. Yes, Lord. <laughs> and Moses went away. Did you, did you catch that before? So he chisels them out. He goes back up on the mountain holding them. He carries his two, to- two stone tablets in his hands. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands. So he says, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God. I don't give people what they deserve. I give mercy. More than that, not only do I give mercy, I give them what they do not deserve, and that's grace. I'm a gracious God. I'm slow to anger. I'm abounding in love and faithfulness. Moses says, show me your glory, and God responds by saying, let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you who I am. Goes on to say in verse 7, God says, friend, and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Punishment has to be uh, given out. But God, in a sense, has a dilemma. How does he do that? He says, I'm good and I'm just, and so I need to fulfill my justice, and so I will pay for your sins. Who paid for your sins? Who paid for your sins? He did, right? In Jesus. Jesus leaves heaven, comes down to earth, he dies then, he rises from the dead, and then offers the gift, if you accept it. And if you accept it, then God forgives your sin. Look now at verse 8, Moses bowed to the ground at once, And he worshiped. Let me give you a glimpse of what's going going on in heaven right now. What's to come in heaven 
what, what, what's going on right now. I mean, on God's timetable, Jesus has done his work of salvation. It's years later. In earth years, we're about 2,000 years later. Look at what they're still doing around the throne right now and for ages to come, Revelation 5. Then I look, John writes, and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. And they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the, and the elders. And in a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. You see, the angels have not moved past Jesus dying for your sins. They've not moved past for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The angels are like, I can't believe this. Have you seen this? Are you kidding me? What a God. And they worship. They worship this one. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven, John writes, and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. All of heaven never tires of looking into what God in his glory has done for you and me. That while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. This grace of God will never stop amazing us as we look on to God for all of eternity. And God wants to show you his glory. He wants to unfold his glory for you. So how do we get this understanding to know me that God talks about? That I am the Lord, the who exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. How do we get glimpses of God's goodness to pass in front of us and to hear the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. How do we catch a glimpse of the glory of God? Well, do what Moses did. Number one, you ask. You ask. Remember, Jesus said, you do not have because you do not ask. So ask. That's what Moses did. Exodus 33 and verse 18, then Moses said, now show me your glory. As he was speaking to the Lord. This is in a sense what Philip was asking of Jesus. John 14 and verse 8, it says, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. He wanted to see the glory of God. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak in my own authority. Rather, is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus says, look to me and you'll see the glory of the Father. So ask. Secondly, then Moses positioned himself. So position yourself. Position yourself. Exodus chapter 33, now in verse 19, the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness, everybody say goodness, to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. Moses, for no one can see me and live. Verse 21 tells us, then the Lord said, there is a place. There is a place. Everybody say, there is a place. There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I'll remove my hand, and, I, and you will see my back, or literally in the Hebrew, my after. You'll see my after, but my face must not be seen. The Lord said, there is a place near me. I, I would say today, as we're this side of the cross, this side of the empty tomb, this side of, of the gospel going out from the church, of what God is doing and giving forgiveness of sin, and our opportunities to come to know him, to come to an understanding of the glory of God, that there are places. 
that there are places. There are places where God's glory is passing by. And when God's glory is passing by these places, you and I need to say, I'm going to be in that place. I'm going to be in that place. You and I need to say, I'm going to position myself in that place. I'm going to position myself to be in his presence, to get to know him more, to understand him more and more, to give of myself and worship to him and of service to him more. Where I'm experiencing the kindness of God, the justice of God, the righteousness of God on earth, where I'm getting glimpses of God's goodness to pass in front of me, to see and to hear the compassion and the grace of God who's slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. There are places. Be sure to get there. This is the importance of the first 10 challenge every day. Remember we gave that at the beginning of the year? New Year's, you know, at the beginning. We did it again when we looked at walking in the fog, walking in the favor of God. How could we get the favor of God on us? And the challenge was to take the first 10 minutes of every day, first 10 minutes, and to open up God's word, then to sit with God, to be in his presence. Reading, reflecting, praying, worshiping. It sets the trajectory for you and God for the rest of the day. It'll soon move into 15 minutes, maybe 20 As God's presence passes you by, there is a place. Everybody say, there's a place. This is the importance of Sunday morning worship with God's people. Because God's glory is going to pass by. Position yourself in God's house because you believe God's glory is going to pass by today. In worship, in communion, in the preaching of the word. So be intentional about being here in his presence, not by accident, not by happenstance, not just I happened to get up early today, so I I, I went in his word and I prayed and and the glory of God came by. I was in his presence. No, do, do it intentionally each day. Same thing with Sunday morning. I just happened to be there on that Sunday, the God's present. No, be there, eat, do it intentionally. Make sure you know it's going to happen. But you'll, you, if you don't, it, it can happen when you're here. But if you don't make it every week, you're going to miss so much glory. Are you going to be okay with that? Okay that you missed it? Okay that your spouse missed it? Okay that your kids missed the glory of God passing by? And for what? For what? Look at verse 24, but let the one who boasts, boasts about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord. The Lord is saying there's no greater thing in all of creation than to be about in life, than to know me, to be with me, to be in my presence with my people. There's a place. Everybody say there's a place. This is the importance of intentionally serving God's people. Where God can have his goodness, his mercy, his grace flow through you and the Holy Spirit's power in you to bless others here, but then also out there. That every week we give the opportunity maybe to be in the nursery with the little ones. You talk about God's goodness in there. To hold that little one so that mom or dad could be in here. That's his goodness. There's a place. Or serving the little older ones to hear their innocent prayers. And their, why, would, why would people not like God? Why, why, Lord, thank you for everyone who's come to church today. To hear them in their innocence. To, to see them discover the truth of God. So that's the importance as God's passing by in Sunday school. In kids' own worship. Sunday night in hill climbers, there's a place to hear the battle our older youth are facing every day in this world and you helping God show them his goodness toward them and how he wants to go with them in Sunday school, youth group tonight. There's a place to serve our singles, our couples, 
uh, to, to, to be and to serve parents raising their kids, to be with them. He, hear the wisdom and the testimony of the older saints as they share how God has been faithful, how God will continue to be faithful to his promises. That's, that's Sunday school. There's a place. There, there's small group. There's a place. There, there's visiting in the hospital, going to the nursing home, going to the shut-ins, serving uh, the community, going on a mission trip. There's a place. There are places God wants you to be positioning yourself in so that you can come to know him, that I am the Lord. One more thing. Look at Exodus 34 and verse 29. When Moses came down now, what is, I mean, you're talking about exercise, up and down, up and down, now he comes down. From Mount Sinai with the two tablets now of the covenant law in his hands that he chiseled, he was not aware that his face was radiant. Everybody say Radiant. Because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant. They were afraid to come near him. But Moses called out to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community, they came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. Verse 33, now when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. When he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, they saw his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord the next time. God wants you to be personally affected by your encounter with his glory. More than just being in his presence, more than just coming to a deeper understanding, but to be changed and reflect in his glory. Moses is shining. He's reflecting God's glory. And, it's, and it affects those around him. He's witnessing for God as he's reflecting God's glory. He's exposing people to the glory of God. God wants you to do the same thing. He wants to do that for you and through you today, that you take for him the light of his glory, that you take it out into darkness, and that they see his light because you reflect the glory of God to them. That's what Jesus did. The prophets summed up his ministry. Look at Matthew 4. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Of those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. That was Jesus' mission, and it's to be your mission too. Jesus says to you, Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So in your workplace, at school, in your community, on the ball field, God is counting on you. Mom, your kids need to see the glory of God in your life. Dad, your kids need to see the glory of God in your life. And to both of you, they need to see the glory of God in your marriage so that they don't look to the world to see what a marriage is, or if there's even a need for a marriage, or who I can marry. Your kids need to see you serve God's people in this place. They need to see you serve God, uh, the, the community when you're away from here to reflect the glory of God for his glory. So how is your life going to reflect? You, you, you've positioned yourself you've experienced, and now you're going to go and reflect. Look again in Exodus 33 and verse 19. The Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So, there, so you're going to be showing his loving kindness you're going to be showing his grace. It's not natural. This is not on your own power. This is the Holy Spirit of God. It's supernatural working through you. So go out into the world after being in the presence of God. Moses didn't just look different from being in God's presence. He is different. 
He's a different person. He's a different leader. He's got this different relationship with God. To the church, Paul writes 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we all, everybody say we. Everybody say all. Everybody say we all. <laughs> and we all who with unveiled faces, no veil for me. Everybody say no veil for me. And we all who with unveiled faces, no, no veil for me, contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This word here, contemplate, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate. Some, some translators would say, behold. We're beholding then the Lord's glory. Others have as looking in a mirror. You know how you look in a mirror. You're looking, and so you're looking at God's glory. You're getting it from all angles. And then notice it says, ever-increasing glory, being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. One translation has from glory to glory. You've already got it, but there's more. There's more glory coming your way. The good news is there's no greater, there's always greater heights of understanding of the glory of God waiting for you. It can be your pursuit all of life and all the way through eternity. Remember when you first saw, you first understood the glory of God. His mercy, his compassion, his love towards you, his forgiveness for you. It led God then to changing you, recreating you into a new person. And you've never been the same. And he'll carry that on showing you his glory. There's something about the reality of God's presence that nothing can ever replace. It, it, it has a powerful effect on God's child, and you can sense it. In Reader's Digest, an agnostic woman, she wrote down these thoughts. I quote now, Over the years I've come to, come to think I'm missing out. My friends and relatives who rely on God the real believers, not just the churchgoers. The real believers, not just the churchgoers. You know there's a difference. Have an expansiveness of spirit. They've experienced the glory of God. They've been in his presence. They have an expansiveness of spirit. This is a, a non-believer, she says this. When they walk along extreme, they don't see water falling over rocks. The sight fills them with ecstasy. They see a realm of hope beyond this world. I just see a babbling brook. Sadly, she writes, I don't get the message. Don't miss out on the glory of God. Be in that position. Be in that place. You'll never be the same. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we've had a glimpse of your interaction with Moses. And Father, may we not just look at him as a great leader, but realize we have so much more going for us than he ever had, that he could even imagine because of what Christ has done for us. Thank you for your spirit within us, your word that we can uh, have at our fingertips, the opportunities to... To, to serve others in your name, your spirit then moving and working through us. May you be glorified all the days of our lives. Father, we know that our labor in the Lord is never in vain. And so we pray that you would help us to lift up Jesus high, that all might see him and come to know him like we do. Ever increase our understanding, we pray, Lord, of knowing you. Through Jesus we pray, amen. Have you ever had the good fortune to be around someone that just seems to make everyone else around them better? Well, I hope you have, because it's really an uplifting experience. Without question, Jesus, while on earth, was the ultimate inspirational person to all those around. 
The Gospel of John shares a host of accounts that will prove this statement true. Now just imagine how Jesus made the woman at Jacob's well feel when he let her know that he wasn't there to judge her for having five ex-husbands and now living with another man. Rather, he was there to offer her a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Or what about the crippled man that was at the pool near the sheep gate of Jerusalem? This invalid had been helpless for a, the past 38 years. Can you fathom the emotions and ex, and he experienced when he was able to pick up his mat and walk at Jesus' command? And what about the woman that was about to be stoned because she was caught in the act of adultery? Jesus stated, if any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. What a rush of emotions there must have been for both the accusers and the accused after no one was left to condemn her. John goes on to tell us in chapter 21, verse 25, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Jesus was surely a source of inspiration for those living 2,000 years ago. Praise God for Jesus coming to earth as a man. Even though the accounts found in God's holy scriptures are awe-inspiring, it is always encouraging to experience such situations firsthand. What an arousing experience when one of God's own creations is able to bring out the best in others. No doubt, Brother Dave can do that here with his preaching and sharing of God's word. And we um, uh, continue to uh, uh, witness the positive impact of the Fab Five, Lee, Mark, Tom, Chuck, and Lester as that they are having on our community for Christ by generously donating their labor, constructing the youth building program or addition. Personally, God has blessed me with a great friend who continues to have that inspirational effect on me. For nearly 25 years, Dan Martin has faithfully been a source of enthusiastic encouragement and positivity. And not just for me, but for countless others, including many students he has taught and players he has coached. Now, if I know Coach Martin, he'd be the first to humbly say, teachers and coaches should try to inspire their students and players. It's all part of the job. I would also venture to say that Dan would agree, at times, however, it is the students and players who end up inspiring their teachers and coaches. And this would be true for the current Morrisonville Lincoln Woods Junior High Co-op softball team. This team has been blessed with a young player who has risen above worldly negativity and discouraging actions and talk and effectively emanates enthusiasm and energy and effort and encouragement to not only her teammates but to her coaches as well. Ella Jenkins might not realize it, but she has a way of making those around her better. Praise God for Christian people, both young and older. In God's great wisdom, he not only provides people who are created in his own image for that day-to-day -day encouragement, he also established a time of communion. Twenty centuries after walking on this planet, Jesus continues to be the ultimate source of encouragement. Because of his blood that was shed on that cross so many years ago, each of our sins and wrongdoings have been covered. Our debt has been paid. And we are provided with an opportunity of one-on-one -on -one communication with our, com our Creator. A time to remember. A time to reflect. A time to appreciate. A time to commit to be more Christ-like. A time to be encouraged. 
Praise God for Christ's sacrifice. Praise God for the sources of encouragement he provides in so many ways. Let's go to our creator right now in prayer. Dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for being there for us. We know we're broken. We know we uh, do wrong, and we come to you right now, and we ask your forgiveness, and we ask you to continue to shed your grace upon us as we commune here this, this morning and as we carry out this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.